Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Tonight, I haven't written very much for you in your outline, but not because this psalm is not extremely important. Uh, it is, and I think I will talk to it a lot more extensively than I have it listed in the outline. Now, your, does your Bible have a Song of Solomon, a Psalm of Solomon? Does it? Some people have listed in their Bibles a Psalm 4, F-O-R, Solomon. But really, it's the exact same designation in Hebrew as we've been studying all the way through when it said a Psalm of David. Well, I don't know why we ought to change it right here. The main reason folks don't like Solomon to have written this psalm, if you'll turn over to the back of the psalm, in verse 20 it says, The prayers of David, son of Jesse, are ended. And they say, see, it says right here in the psalm that David wrote it. Well, verse 20 is a summary conclusion to the whole second book of Psalms. And I think it has nothing to do with Psalm 72 at all. So, the setting of Psalm 72 is the righteous king. I think it's a messianic psalm. It could apply to David, but because it has the king's son in here, it seems to me Solomon is the more appropriate person, not only to have written it, but in his own, the setting of his day. So I, I think the title is accurate, though it is traditional. It's in the Masoretic text, but it's still traditional. Uh, okay, let's go through this then and look. And before we start... How many of you, if you'll just look down the page of that psalm real quick, glance with your eye, how many of you have a translation that says, uh, he will judge his people in verse 2? He will vindicate the afflicted, verse 4. Uh, he will come down like rain, verse 6. How many of you have a translation, he will? What, what is that? What translation? New International. How many of you have may he or let him? King James, New American Standard. Anybody have a King James? But he shall, still future tense, and he shall, that's very good still. Uh, here is the fight. Remember, a lot of times in Greek, I talk about a verb tense, and when I talk about a verb tense, I'm pretty confident that I can lock down on the meaning of that verb tense to convey spiritual truth. Because that verb tense means something, it means something specific, there's boundaries in which that verb tense moves. But Greek is a very sophisticated, developed language compared to ancient Hebrew. It's a very early language. And the verb tenses are extremely fluid in Hebrew. This can be he will or he shall, and it can be may he. And it's very hard to know which. We have no example of an extended may he poetry which makes it uh, a wish or optative. This, with all other Hebrew that we have, should be at the affirmation of he will or he shall. So New American Standard, in my opinion, is off in this psalm. And I think it's an affirmation of what the Israeli king on the throne at the moment will do, but it is foreshadowing what the righteous king, the king of kings, the Messiah king, will do in fullness one day. So I think it's definitely messianic. And matter of fact, in verse 1 where it says, Give the king thy judgments, O God. In the Targum, which is a translation in Aramaic and, and uh, commentary there, it has, Give the king Messiah thy judgments, O God. And there is an affirmation from the court of Jews. Okay, The rabbis did that before the controversy over who Jesus was ever came into. Targum's written very early. <coughs> Excuse me. So I think it is uh, a messianic psalm written by Solomon during his life. Notice where it says the second part of verse 1, And thy righteousness to the king's son. Now that sounds to me like Solomon. <clears throat> I have CF 1 Kings 3, 6 through 9, which of course goes back to the affirmations of, of Solomon. When God said, what do you want, Solomon? Ask me anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And Solomon said, give me wisdom to judge thy people correctly. 
and God was pleased with that prayer. And here is the same affirmation here. The first crack out of the bag, what this righteous king wants, this ideal king, is knowledge to judge the people in righteousness and justice. Uh, verse 2. Now, all the way through, this new American standard is going to say, May he, but I think it should be, He will or he shall. May he judge thy people with righteousness and thine afflicted with justice. So it's going to be surprising to you how many times through here, again and again, this psalmist is going to mention that one characteristic of the ideal king or the Messiah is the way he treats the underprivileged, the down and out, and those that nobody really takes a mind to. God is characterized by his fatherhood of the widow, the alien, the sojourner, the orphan, and the poor. Better mess with somebody rich than mess with somebody helpless. Because you mess with somebody helpless, you just got God against you. Now, notice where it says in verse 3, Let the mountains bring peace to the people and the hills in righteousness. Now, why would they talk about mountains and hills? Uh, the Bible speaks a lot about, From the hills come my help. You know, I look to the mountains and they came my help and all. The mountains are very conspicuous in Israel. There's not any real mountains except Mount Hermon, far north. Um, Mount Carmel is, uh, compared to the Rockies, is a big anthill. You know, it's just not that big a hill. And the other mountains are the same kind of thing. There is no real tall mountains. But when they do appear, they're often out in the middle of nowhere. They just Mount Carmel is all by itself, middle of a plain, like a big pimple. <laughs> Oh, well. Anyway, it does. <laughs> and it's just out. It's a noticeable landmark. So I think it's a, a way of talking about all the land of Israel, okay? Uh, no, verse 4. He shall, or may he, vindicate the afflicted. Again, the afflicted. Save the children of the needy. Crush the oppressor. I want you to remember. I want you to remember clearly. That on Judgment Day, when the great white throne is set up, and the king of kings separates the sheep from the goats. And he turns to them and says, How many of you walked the aisle of the church and trusted me by faith? Is that what he says? He says, I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. And I was naked, and you didn't clothe me. And I was thirsty, and you didn't give me a drink. And I was in prison, and you didn't visit me. And he said, Lord, when did we ever see you like that? He said, when you didn't do it to the least of one of these mine, you didn't do it to me. Judgment is based on our lifestyle response to people. Now, I, of course, believe it starts with an affirmation of faith in the heart of a believer as he trusts Christ. But that affirmation, as James would say, faith without a commensurate lifestyle is not of God. Hear me good. Faith, without a commensurate lifestyle, I'm not putting any time on that, without a commensurate lifestyle is not of God. It is impossible to say yes to Jesus with the mouth and not have a changed perspective of the heart and a new attitude of the mind about those who are less fortunate than us. Now, notice in verse 5, it says, Let them fear thee. Now, you have something else in your translation, don't you? I believe that uh, King James, following, following the Septuagint, which is, the, of course, the Greek translation the Old Testament has, and they shall continue. Now, <clears throat> Masoretic text, and they shall fear him, there's been, a, there's been some alteration of some Hebrew consonants here. The very fact that he shall continue is a truth that is expressed all the way through this psalm, beginning in verse 5. But that they shall fear him seems to be at least the best Hebrew we've got. Okay? So, uh, mine has, let them fear thee. And notice these different, these different words for eternity. Now, this is why I think it's a messianic psalm and not just talking about an earthly prince or an earthly king. Listen to what it says. Verse 5. While the sun endures. Okay? Second part of verse 5. As long as the moon throughout all generations. Second part of verse 7. Till the moon is no more. And uh, there's even more of those. Where's the other one? 
me find verse 17. Yeah, his name is to endure forever as long as the sun shines. Now, you think we're talking about some, something and somebody more here than earthly king? Yes, obviously we are. Obviously. Uh, this king, whoever he was, will not be around as long as the sun. Now, you say, well, scientifically, the sun is going to burn out in a thermonuclear exhaustion in about 12 billion B.C., or, you know, billion years, and therefore this is obviously not scientific. Eh, wasn't meant to be scientific. The writer didn't have the scientific knowledge you did. He didn't send a probe into the sun and check the length of the thermonuclear reaction. This is a way of describing in the Hebrew faith if the sun's going to last, which they think it'll last forever. You say, but the New Testament says the sun will pass away. It's not New Testament. <laughs> it's Old Testament. These are the Hebrew ways of affirming eternity. Now, isn't it, isn't it uh, worth noting that as the countries around Israel, and even Israel itself was influenced by it, worship the heavenly bodies. Don't you think it's interesting Messiah is described in terms that say that the heavenly bodies are not deities, but simply things that mark the time of the Messiah. So here we have the Hebrew affirmation that the, plant, the Hebrew affirmation that astrology is the pits, <laughs> non-existent, the deities and powers of the planet and star. Now, um, talks about may he come or he will come like rain upon mown, mowed grass or mown grass, like showers that water the earth. Have you been out to... Isn't it fresh to be in your backyard after you've mowed it and it's a little wet? Isn't that, beautiful? Isn't that a beautiful experience? Unless you have allergies. I mean, Messiah doesn't have allergies, does it? Uh, it, it, have you ever the freshness of that, the joy of that? If you were a desert people, you would really rejoice. First of all, the fact there's grass to cut, and second of all, the fact there's rain to make it smell when you do cut it. So, you know, that's a freshness that the Messiah is going to bring into his world. And speaks of the fact that his days, uh, in his days, may the righteous flourish and abundance of peace till the moon is no more. The word for peace here in verse 3 and in verse 7 is the word Shalom, shalom. Uh, it means the absence of evil and the presence of good. Uh, notice in verse 8 where it says, that May he rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Now here is a, a recurring element that we'll see many more times in this psalm, the universal reign of the king of kings, the universal reign of the divinic ruler that will come, the universal reign of Shiloh, uh, he's not going to reign in Israel. He's going to reign in all the earth. Okay? And notice the little phrase from sea to sea. Now, does that mean from the uh, Pacific Ocean to the Mediterranean Ocean? What, what's that sea to sea? Well, if you'll look at Genesis fifteen eighteen 18 and Exodus 23, 31, you'll know the outer bounds of the promised land, promised to Abraham and later promised to uh, Moses and the children of Israel was from the great sea. Now, when you, it says the great sea, you can mark it in the Bible, it's the Mediterranean. To the river. And what, what is the river? The river Euphrates. Okay? Now, Genesis 18 says, from the river Euphrates to the river of Egypt, which is that southern border down there by Egypt. But the great sea would be the Mediterranean coast. That is the promised boundaries of the nation of Israel. And she never has reached that. Even in the kingdom of Solomon, she wasn't quite there. The kingdom of David wasn't quite there. Now, from sea to sea, there's the promise. From the river to the ends of the earth, universal kingdom. Let the nomads of the desert bow before him. Now, you know, those of you who've listened to me now for several years know that I have a theology of redemption that does not cover simply human beings, but covers animals and the in, uh, inanimate creation. The word here for nomads is used in the Old Testament primarily of animals. It is used one or two places for people, but it's, as a primary reference, it's animals. It's almost like the animals of the desert bow before him. I want to tell you, that Philippians 2 passage, 9 through 11, that says, Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Because of my understanding of the redemption of nature, as the created beings, both angelic and human, bow before the King of Kings, I see the donkey and the wolf and the lion, and the birds, and the snakes, and the turtles, 
and the reptiles bowing their heads in praise before the creator of all that is. I see the rocks crying out in adoration. I want to tell you creation will be completely redeemed in every part. And there is fellowship possible with the animals that you have not dreamed of because we live in a fallen world. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11 is a good play, way to talk about that, beginning in verse 6. And by the way, this whole psalm is quite parallel to Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 5, and Isaiah chapter 60 through 62. Now, notice here where it speaks about um, that the kings of Tarsus. Now, what, what other book in the Old Testament have you heard the name Tarsus before? Where? Oh, come on. Jonah. That's where Jonah was hooking them for is Tarshish. Now, where is Tarshish? That is a proverbial name for the farthest most point westward. It was in Spain. It was a seaport on Spain. Now, that was the limits of their understanding of the ends of the earth was Tarshish. Okay? Now, the other side is the islands uh, and the islands. Now, in Isaiah 42.10 is a good way to see that the, the islands are another expression, a Hebraic idiom, for the ends of the earth. We're talking about the universal kingdom again. From Tarshish to the islands is a Jewish way of saying from the east to the west and all that's in between is what we're talking about. Now notice that, that the islands, the kings of these two places are going to bring presents and then the kings of Sheba and Seba offer gifts and the kings bow down. Here we have three parallel expressions of bringing presents, bringing gifts, bowing down. This is a sign of submission. This is a sign of universal reign. Now, notice where it says Sheba and Seba. Uh, what's the difference? Well, to be quite honest with you, we don't know. Uh, Sheba is a kingdom in the southwest corner of the Arabian Peninsula that is modern-day Yemen. Now, in the biblical times, it was somewhat protected from all the foreign invaders because way down south, it's a desert to go through, there's mountains to cross. It's a great trading center. The queen of Sheba came to see Solomon, didn't she? First Kings chapter 6, no, chapter 10. Now, it is suppositional, but somewhat an educated supposition that Seba, with just the S, is the African colony of the same Sabbatines that started uh, Sheba, and it may be the African colony of these same seafaring traders called the Sebians, or S-A-B-E-A-N, okay? So they come to offer gifts, and then let all the kings bow down before him, and all the nations serve him again, the universal reign of God, okay? Now, by the way, this is almost a way, by saying all these kings are going to come offer him, it's almost a way of saying the Messiah is the king of kings. If kings bow down to him, he's the king of kings. Beautiful expression. Verse 12. For he will deliver the needy when he cries out for help, the afflicted also, and him who has no helper, he will have compassion on the poor and the needy, and the lives of the needy he will save, and he will rescue their their life from oppression and violence, and their blood will be precious in his sight. God help the man that robs the poor, takes advantage of the helpless. Now, in the world's eyes, the masses of this world that are poor and hungry and dirty and smelly and helpless and untrained and ignorant, we kind of write off as not very important. But I want to tell you, verse 14 says, their blood is precious in God's sight. Life is worth living because God is the author of life, and there is no such thing as an insignificant life or a expendable life for society's expediency. I say to you, life is important to God, and just because we make judgments about whether life is good or bad, we best back off and know that life comes from the hand of God, and God better be the one to take it back and not us. Uh, verse 15. So he may live, so may he live, and may the gold of, of Sheba be given to him, and let them pray for him continually, and let them bless him all day. 
long. This is a new added note. This is not anywhere else in the Old Testament as far as predictive element about the Messiah. Nowhere else in the Bible that I know of does it say that we are to pray for the Messiah all day long. Now, there's many, many times in the Bible that, that we talk about a daily faith or living by faith daily. Now, that, that, is, that is spoken of as the lifestyle faith in the present. We don't live in the past. We don't live in the future. We live by faith day by day. We accept from the hand of God day by day. We don't ask for a blueprint of the future. We don't cry over the spilt milk of the past. We live for Jesus in the present. Have you ever thought, now maybe you have prayed for the second coming. I think all of us in times of sorrow or depression or great need long to see him face to face. But as part of your pray always without ceasing, has part of that been to pray and praise the glorified Christ of heaven before he comes? Have you ever thought about part of your daily prayers being thanking God for Jesus? new element here. I think it speaks of lifestyle prayer. I think that's a valid New Testament understanding that prayer in the highest sense is not at dinner time and not on Sundays, but prayer in the highest sense is relating every experience to God through Christ of your conscious life. And I think sometimes our unconscious life can be connected to God by prayer. Verse 16. May there be abundance of grain on the earth, on the top of the mountains. Its fruit will wave like the cedars of Lebanon, and may those from the city flourish like the vegetation of the earth. Let me go back through that a bit and do a little Hebrew word study with you. I think it will bring it to life. The word abundance is only used here. When a word is used only once in Hebrew, it is very, very difficult to know what it means. It is modern scholarship that says this word means abundance. The rabbis say this word means a handful. Tradition says it means not abundance, but meagerness. And so they would say the first part of verse 1 means it started out small, but look how big it got. It's almost like Jesus' parable of the mustard seed, how little it is, but how great a tree it becomes. If I had my druthers, because modern scholarship is just as presuppositional as tradition, because we do not know where this word comes from, we have no other uses parallel, I think it's talking about a handful. It's saying there may be a handful of grain in the earth on top of the mountains. Now, I want you to remember in Israel, we don't have any mountains like the Rockies. Even Mount Carmel is terraced, planted all the way up. Remember, Phil, how they would just terrace those hills and use every inch of soil. So it is not saying that on the mountaintop, if we, if we were talking in America and saying, let's grow wheat on the mountaintops, that would be the promise of abundance. If, if wheat had grown on the mountaintops where only snow and trees even can grow, it would be a symbol of abundance. But in Israel that has no large mountains, but that Mount Carmel, not Carmel, but uh, Mount Hermon, they grow things right up on top of those things. So here again, I think it's a symbol of meagerness instead of abundance we're talking about. But it moves from meagerness to tremendous abundance. Here we go. Its fruit will wave like the cedars of Lebanon. Now the word wave in Hebrew, how many of y'all have ever uh, lived in East Texas in the pines or in Rio Dos in the pines? Don't you miss the sound, that beautiful sound of wind going through the top of pine trees? Oh, it's a soothing sound. It's a it's a rustling. It's a, it's a beautiful sound. That is the sound. The Hebrew word here is the sound of wind as it passes through trees. And it's talking about the cedars of Lebanon, which are uh, not pines, but like them. It's that, it's that sound, of a, a sound of beauty there, the fruit, as it sounds like the cedars of Lebanon. Now, I have, I'm not an agricultural person at all. But I can't remember times in being dove hunting out in, a, let's say, a cornfield that's become dry and almost ready to, to harvest. And you can almost hear the wind coming from one side of the field to the other, can't you? It'll rustle, and it'll rustle all the way through that field. That's what it's talking about here. It's the sound of abundance of grain and harvest that you can hear the wind begin to run through that field. Also, the next one is, and, those, and may those from the city flourish like vegetation. Only on pictures, and the only time I remember seeing this that I can remember, you know the little wheat-thin commercial, that little blonde-haired girl, what's 
for that. Who? Sandy Duncan. You know how she tiptoes through that big wheat field and the wind's blowing, you know? And Have you ever noticed how wheat changes colors when the wind blows it? One, it, 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 it almost glistens as the wind. Have you ever seen what I'm talking about? Yeah. Uh, this word for flourish is the word for shine. It's the word again for wind passing through a grain field, and as it turns that grain, parts glisten, and it's almost like a ripple of, of light going across that harvestable grain. I've seen it a lot in other kinds of the underside of leaves sometimes, or some kind of crops. When the wind blows, you can see part of the underside of leaves different color, and it's almost like a changing color pattern across those fields. That's what the word flourish means, to shine in the wind. Talking about abundance here, okay? Uh, his name endure forever. Again, got two things. God's character is what's spoken of, of the character of this, of this ideal king, and may it endure forever. And may his name increase, sprout forth, produce, as long as the sun shines. And again, uh, that's a tremendous promise of longevity. Now, the second part, pardon me. I was talking about all that food and started burping. Uh, second part of verse 17 uh, is the uh, biblical promise of God to Abraham in Genesis 12, 2 and 3. Uh, notice what it says, And let men bless themselves by him, and that all the nations called him blessed. That's part of the Abrahamic covenant. And so I think it's another good, good point, this is a messianic psalm. The reason I keep saying that is this psalm is never quoted one place in the New Testament as a messianic psalm, never once. Uh, but it just seems to me that it is. I, I can't get around it personally. Uh, notice in verse 18. Some think that 18 is a closing prayer to the second book, the whole second book of Psalms. I personally think it's a closing prayer to the, to the 72nd Psalm because it, it ends abruptly in verse 17 if this isn't a closing prayer. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone works wonders. Now, I want to... There's a little book out. It's kind of an old book. I think it's by... Uh, Albright. It's called the God Who Acts. Have you ever noticed that, that Yahweh or our God is the only God that acts? All other gods are stone and wood and cannot hear and the, are the figments of men's minds. But the only God that acts is the living God of the Old Testament and New Testament. When, he, when you pray to him, he hears. When you ask him in faith, he moves. He is the God who acts. That's a beautiful name for our God. The God who acts. Blessed uh, be his glorious name forever, and may the whole earth be filled with his glory. Again, the universal kingdom. All men, all nations, all tongues, all tribes standing around the throne of God and singing the new song to the Messiah. It's Revelation chapter 5 in the Old Testament. Amen, amen. And that simply means I agree, I agree. Truth, truth. It's a Hebrew word for affirmation. And then verse 20. The prayers of David, son of Jesse, are ended. And of course, the whole second book of Psalm is made up mostly of the prayers of David, though not exclusively, as we have seen. Okay, questions or comments? Yes, here. Yeah, it's just talking about may the population centers increase. As there's going to be great produce, there's going to be more people to eat it. It's almost a reflection of the biblical promise, be fruitful and multiply. So in the first verse we have crops multiplying, in this verse we have people multiplying. God would be pleased in our adult one department. I think everybody in this church under 30 is pregnant. How many... How many people do we have in adult one that are pregnant? About 15? Now that's an Old Testament promise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Woo. Mercy. We're going to grow our Sunday school to the nursery. <laughs> Nursery's got 300 and the rest. <laughs> Boy, y'all are not very lively tonight. Anybody else? Question or comment? Yes, Randy?
Yeah, that's n not a good translation. Thir Exodus 23:15. Okay, I guess what I'm picking up on uh, from the that is the Reed Sea there. That is that is the Hebrew there. To the Sea of the Philistines. Now that would be the Mediterranean. So what they're saying, they're making a three-cornered triangle. Uh, that reference to the Reed Sea would be the same one in Genesis 15, 18 as the river of Egypt, okay? That, the Egyptian boundary there is what they're talking about. And that, that would be here, and in the Mediterranean would be the Sea of the Philistines, which would be here. And then the, the other boundary would be the Euphrates, which, as you know, curves back up like this. So it's, it's three-sided boundary. Right, thank you for that. Good translation, after all. <laughs> notice, notice in your while well, you got your Bibles up there to Exodus twenty-three thirty-one. Notice it says the river, and then Euphrates is in in italics. Remember that italics is not in the Hebrew; it's supplied for an English reader's understanding. When the Old Testament says the river, it always refers to Euphrates, never the Tigris, but the Euphrates. 